everyone. Hello. Uh, I just want <clears throat> to state a uh, small disclaimer b before I begin. I'm going to be talking about the philosophy of conspiracy theories. So naturally, there's going to be some mention of actual conspiracies. Uh, the first slide is going to be about 9-11, and then I'm going to talk about vaccines. So I realize these are sort of uh, sensitive topics. So in, in that sense, this is a kind of trigger warning for you to sort of brace yourselves so, so you can be ready. Uh, so yeah, so with, with your permission, I can begin, right? Okay, cool. So I was, I was nine years old when the 9-11 terror attacks happened. And I remember that moment quite vividly. I was uh, playing actually video games with one of my friends, uh, Yorgos, uh, at the time. And his mother interrupted us. She barged in, uh, into the room to switch the channel, right, to put on the news. And at that point, we saw the graphic imagery of the second plane, I think, uh, going into the building. And that image stays with me to this day. It's quite graphic. Um, and arguably, as a kind of response uh, to that sort of traumatic event, a few years later, when I was around 13, I'm guessing, I adopted what could be called my first conspiracy theory, right? And this is... Uh, this was a version of uh, what some people call the no-plane theory. This is the theory that says that there were no actual planes involved in the attacks. And the planes you see on news reports and all that, these are just <laughs> CGI or doctored in some sense. Uh, now, of course, uh, I can now safely say that there were planes involved in the attacks. And I, I had fallen a victim of some very bad and arguably dangerous uh, thinking. So this sort of embarrassing anecdote, what this illustrates is that conspiracy theorizing can go wrong. It, it can go very wrong. But I think it would be premature to state that every kind of conspiracy theorizing is wrong or a mistake. And there are cases where conspiracy theories turn out to be true. The classic example is the Watergate case, a cookie cutter case, if you, uh, if you will. It was, in fact, the case that the Nixon campaign uh, actively spied upon their democratic opponents, or consider the time when the French government used spies to plant explosives on a Greenpeace vessel. Or if that's not, if that's not crazy enough for you already, consider the time in the 50s when the CIA staged vampire-like attacks in the Philippines in order to scare off the local communist militia, the so-called hacks. So I think this illustrates quite clearly that a kind of wholesale rejection of conspiracy theories is, is a mistake. And a kind of assumption here is a minimal definition of conspiracy theory. A conspiracy theory is just like any other kind of theory. One that purports to explain a phenomenon by appeal uh, of a conspiracy. Now, the question I would like to explore is how do we know? How can we differentiate? How can we distinguish between the warranted and the unwarranted conspiracy theory? The true from the false, if you will. And I'm going to try to explore this question by focusing on one particular case study, which is COVID-19 vaccine-related conspiracy theories. I'm sure you've come across them yourselves. Uh, roughly speaking, I mean, there are many variations, but, but, but roughly speaking, the idea is that the vaccines in, in every kind of variety, they are dangerous, and mainstream science is basically lying to us about their safety. Uh, now, according to what could be called a traditional account of evaluating and sort of exploring these conspiracy theories, you would adopt a kind of two-step strategy. You would sort of identify and then unpack the evidence. And make no mistake, there is evidence for those conspiracy theories. There's an abundance of them, actually. You, I mean, conspiracy theories of this sort, they appeal to so-called VAERS data. VAERS is a kind of self-reporting system for vaccine side effects, right? Uh, they might appeal to expert authority. Uh, there's a guy called Robert Malone. He claims to be the inventor of the mRNA vaccine technology, and he says that, that the vaccine is dangerous, so he must know something, right? Uh, there are so-called undocumented deaths. They are portrayed in many documentaries, like a recent one is this one, Died Suddenly. Uh, there are all sorts of scientific papers claiming that vaccines are dangerous. There are whistleblowers from Pfizer uh, there are also supposedly better alternatives, like ivermectin, and so, and so on and so forth. And many, many more. This is just the, the peak of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. Now, I, 
I don't want to knock on the traditional account because in most cases this is the only thing we can do, you know, identify the evidence, unpack it, and sort of dissect it. And this is an admirable and sort of important practice, this kind of Reuters-style fact-checking. But I think there is, um, it has some limitations. And so I think this gives us reason to seek for alternatives. The limitation is pr pragmatic in nature. So when you're trying to dissect this kind of evidence, it's like a can of worms. You open the can and, and you basically get this onslaught of different sort of elements. You have these papers here, you have all these graphs, people who sort of seem uh, uh, trustworthy, telling you that the vaccines are not dangerous. So you basically get assaulted from, from all sides, right? And of course, if you stick your guns and you stay there and sort of examine everything, uh, most of this previous evidence is problematic, right? But the idea here is that we should try to find a way we can avoid getting the can of worms worry, uh, if you will. So, so my suggestion is that instead of looking at the evidence, instead of, trying, instead of diving into the evidence, you should try to identify where the conspiracy theory came from. Right? So, so ignore the evidence. Uh, in, and if you apply that kind of reasoning to COVID-19 conspiracy theories, what you get is that these theories are not sort of regular theories. They're not spontaneous occurrences. They are actually the result of systematic anti-vaccine lobbying, right? And it turns out that 70% of this kind of content can be traced back to the same source, what could be called the anti-vax ecosystem, right? Now, the anti-vax ecosystem is basically a multi-million dollar uh, industry, right? They sell supplements, they sell subscriptions, they sell all sorts of things, right? And uh, they existed way before COVID, and they are also concerned with not only the COVID-19 vaccine, but with every vaccine, right? If you, if, if you want to put a face on these people here, some of them, you might recognize uh, Andrew Wakefield, especially people from the UK. He's the guy that suggested that the MMR vaccine is linked to autism. Uh, now, let me tell you a story. So when the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, began, during the initial stages, these people actually met at a, uh, uh, a semi-secret conference uh, organized by the National Vaccine Information Center. And basically what happened there is that they laid out, they strategized, they laid out their game plan on how they would take advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic in order to propagate their sort of anti-vaccine propaganda. Here's a telling quote by RFK Jr. He's one of the key players in all of this. He says, all of the truths that we've been trying to broadcast for many, many years, those seeds are landing on very fertile grounds. So the idea is that this is not, uh, yeah, these conspiracy theories are not spontaneous occurrences. They do not figure in the marketplace of ideas like every other kind of idea. Uh, COVID-19 conspiracy theories are basically simply repackaged anti-vax propaganda. They're, they're not something new. Uh, and my main claim here is that this is, this is all you need to know when you're trying to evaluate these theories. You do not need to look in, in, into the data, you don't need to read the graphs, the papers, you don't need to consult the experts. Just know that these theories are basically, simply noting that the genealogy of those theories is problematic is enough for you to sort of not engage with those theories. And make no mistake, this is not an isolated kind of phenomenon. There are other kinds of theories which are also prone to this kind of genealogical investigation. Consider climate change conspiracy theories. Uh, again, you could look into the evidence, or you can simply note that in the 70s, the fossil fuel lobby actually fabricated and produced conspiracy theories about climate change. And that's enough, right? Or consider the time when the... Uh, uh, you consider the theory that the, the HIV virus was produced in a U.S. lab. Uh, that theory was actually produced by the KGB in the context of the Cold War, right? So I think this illustrates that yet another reason for why conspiracy theorizing is not inherently problematic, right? If what I've said is true, then it turns out that at least some conspiracy theories are themselves the result of a conspiracy. I mean, think about it. The anti-vax lobby conspired in order to create COVID-19 conspiracy theories, or the fossil fuel industry also conspired in order to create uh, climate change conspiracy theories. 
So it turns out that unmasking such conspiracy theories involves adopting a conspiracy theory about those theories, a kind of meta-conspiracy theory, if you will. So we started off with the idea that to be a conspiracy theory risk is a kind of paranoid activity, right? Inherently irrational. But as a kind of reconciliatory note to my past self, uh, I think that there are at least some cases where conspiracy theorizing can do good instead of evil. Thank you. Again, Alex from VGU. Um, thanks very much for the great talk. I'm wondering, do you think that this kind of way of framing it can be helpful in changing people's minds? You know, if you have some crazy uncle who believes in all these COVID conspiracy theories. Right. Do you think this is a good way to kind of approach it with them? Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, that's not really my ball game. Uh, I'm not really concerned with what convinces people. That's more of a psychological, empirical question, right? Uh, mostly what I'm worried about is the normative question, what we should believe, right? But, you know, if, if for, for what it's worth, right? I have some anecdotal evidence that <laughs> uh, sort of, this is a way of, of sympathizing with the conspiracy theorists, right? Because you're saying that the conspiratorial mindset is not a mistake by itself, uh, but you should focus on the right conspiracy. You should try to consider that the conspiracy theory you are adopting is itself the result of a conspiracy, right? So that's maybe a way you can sort of get into the same mindset and sort of try to sympathize with them in that sense. But uh, it's an open empirical question if you want to explore it, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, Herman from Hebrew University. Uh, what can we do when the conspiration theory is based on the mistake of our authority? For example, when there was COVID, mm. When said that Africa will be a place where people will die, mm -hmm. okay? But we found out that they're not true. And a few months later, you went send vaccine to Africa, and people believe that okay, they predict that we'll die, and then we don't die, and they, they send vaccine. So there was very consp conspiracy theory in that moment. So can, can, how can we solve that issue? Uh, so can I ask you, so can I have a follow-up question about this? So do you remember what kind of conspiracy theories they were involved in that case? Yeah, the, the theory was, uh, was uh, you and predict that people will die in Africa. Mm. Then there's not, there was not true. People don't die so much compared to other uh, continents. Right. And after a few years, uh, there was vaccine, COVID mm. vaccine who, uh, who come to Africa. And people believe that this vaccine will, will kill African people. That was that conspiracy theory. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, that's a, a great case. And actually, uh, I haven't really looked into the, uh, into the sort of um, how conspiracy theories about the vaccines sort of played out in Africa. Uh, I was under the impression that people were mostly sort of, sort of, they were in their mind mindset in Africa because they had the experiences with Ebola and, uh, and all that. So in that sense, uh, um, yeah, but I have to think about this, uh, this more. Thank you. Um, I think it is also an empirical question whether uh, it is, in fact, the case that in most cases, conspiracy theories are a difference maker. So in some cases, maybe conspiracy theories actually have a causal effect, but in some cases, maybe they don't. Uh, so yeah, I guess in that case, we might want to sort of discuss the details. So yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Rolando from Hebrew University. Uh, first, I, I would like to know more about the vampire stuff in the <laughs> Philippines. That's, I didn't know it, it looks interesting. No, and uh, you claim basically that um, conspiracy theories, you should look if there is some kind of interest in divulgating this kind of theory. But don't you think that this is also what conspiracy, usually these people say about Pfizer or for yeah, example, yeah. is the same mindset. And don't you think, for example, that people of the non-vaccine from anti-vax people they really believe that the vaccine are problematic, for example. They are not only for making money, they really, they are really, uh, yeah, good. they have a wrong opinion. Good, good. Uh, some of them do, I mean, maybe most of them, but, but the higher ups, I think, are, are perfectly aware that the vaccines actually work. And some of them are, are even vaccinated themselves in, 
you know, having had you know, most of the vaccines, <laughs> not only the COVID ones. So, um, uh, so, so about the second word you said, um, I think it's deeper than simply identifying potential interests behind a conspiracy theory. It's not only that there's some kind of malicious intent, but there's, a, there's an active, complicated di disinformation mechanism producing these theories. So it's not only that you know, uh, they want to produce conspiracy theories, but they also have a very complicated manner of producing them. So for example, just to mention an example, I, I, I wasn't able to go into that very much, but uh, these companies, they even, uh, the ex-psychologist from Cambridge Analytica actually works on them. So, they, so it's an understatement to say that it's, uh, it's very complicated. So for example, they're using meme testing, uh, they're using a technique called astroturfing, where they're basically they're creating fake movements, fake grassroots movements, so they can sort of show that there's an issue to be discussed, even though there's no issue at all. Uh, so yeah, so, 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 the, so the proposal here is that there's malicious intent and also a mechanism to produce these theories. So that's the idea, basically. In the Pfizer case, um, you could say there is malicious intent, but uh, you wouldn't say that Pfizer has a special disinformation mechanism. I mean, maybe you do, I'm not sure. Yeah, we can discuss about this. Yeah, well, good point though, thank you. <laughs> about the uh, hacks, about the, the Philippines case, I'll talk to you afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for the sunny reference. Oh, uh, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Brilliant. Absolutely. I just had to. I just anyway. had to. Yeah. Um, uh, Hebrew University. Hebrew University. Jerusalem, I think. Um, my name is Flavio. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I like the shift. I, I, I like the. My experience, too, is that the, there is a tension between an internal type of worldview, right? A, a way of seeing reality, which you call in a way genealogy. You're trying to trace it even, which is even more powerful. And, and an external looking for evidence, right? And if you go into the realm of the evidence, you lose, in my estimation. It's, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's they're, they're, because in a way, you're starting to play the game. You're, 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 you're starting to play the game that they want to play. Um, I think the looking at the worldview and where it's coming from and how it's interconnected is is it's, it's a very powerful shift I, I really like i really like the idea i think you're onto something there so uh, it's a lot of work too it's 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 just as it, it's probably even more complicated than the other one than looking at the details but yeah. but it's uh, it's psychologically and historically much more relevant and more interesting so kudos right nice. thank you thank you so, uh, so much for this i'm not sure actually if it's if it is always the case that is more difficult, that the genealogical approach is more difficult than actually looking at the evidence. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, in the case of, uh, of anti-lockdown sort of rallies, right, you can see who organized those, and by a very simple, like, journalistic investigation, you can sort of tell who was behind these rallies. And I think that kind of investigation is easier than sort of looking to the papers, consulting experts, and which experts are, are you going to consult? It's like a whole like issue. So yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Eugenio, Haifa University. So I have a question as a scholar, so to speak. So isn't there a methodological problem, if you want there? So it doesn't the principle innocent until proven guilty <laughs> apply in these kind of cases? And I was thinking of, a, maybe it's not a fitting example, but an example from, let's say, the field of archaeology. I was thinking of Heinrich Schliemann, who found Troy. <laughs> For a very long period, people looked at him like a conspiracy theorist. He was looking at Homer like it was real history. And look and behold, he did find something. So there was, of course, maybe it was chance, maybe it was something else. But isn't there an, also an ethical problem in not looking at the evidence as you would, for instance, for uh, phenomena, parallel phenomena that come from, oh, sorry, <laughs> they, come from, <laughs> uh, they come from different sources. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, that's a fair question, I think. Uh, but uh, sort of, so when we're doing, and it's, uh, this is a kind of social epistemology, right? So we're trying to figure out what to believe when applied to social issues, right? And when we're dealing with the sort of questions, we're not in the abstract realm, realm where we have infinite time and infinite resources. We have to carefully, sort of pragmatically speaking, we should do, 
we should find some general guidelines which will sort of allow us to um, um, to prioritize our targets, right? So it, it, I guess the genealogical method is one way where you could sort of weed out sort of, uh, the, more, the best candidates for investigation, right? Uh, but of course, it might turn out that even the most outrageous conspiracy theories, uh, you know, is true. That's a fact of life, right? And if you are really committed into sort of proving that a conspiracy theory is true, then be my guest. Uh, you will be doing a service to all of us. But in, in most cases, what we, we do not have infinite time, so we have to prioritize our targets, and applying the genealogical method is one way of doing that. So, yeah. Alexius, our time is up. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you.